what they've done in Afghanistan, most embarrassing, horrible moment in United States history. I believe that, too. I think it was the most humiliating time in history. And we were leaving. We were getting out. 21 years, I had it down to 2,000, but we were going to keep Bagram, a massive Air Force base that we spent billions and billions of dollars building many years ago. Not for Afghanistan. We were keeping it because it's one hour away from where China makes their nuclear weapons. But they left Bagram. They left the lights on. They left the dogs there, by the way. They said they didn't, but they did. All the things I said, but they left Bagram. So now China is occupying Bagram Air Base. I want to tell you a quick little story because it's so depressing when you see something like Afghanistan where we left back $85 billion worth of brand new beautiful equipment, where we left American hostages behind, and where 13 soldiers were killed. 13, think of it. 13 soldiers were killed, but what they don't say is the many, many soldiers, a far bigger number than that, who lost their arms, their legs, their face, who were, who were just, it should have never happened. In fact, I proudly say, and they confirmed that, 18 months, not one American soldier was killed in Afghanistan. And I spoke to the leader of the Taliban. I got a lot of bad stories because I did that by the fake news media, which is right back there. So is a lot of them because I wanted that to stop. And I spoke, his name is Abdul. I said, Abdul, you're killing our people. And they were really killing a lot of people from the previous administration. I mean, they were shooting them so badly, snipers shooting our people. And I said, Abdul, don't kill our people anymore. You kill our people anymore. You'll be hit harder than anybody has ever been hit before. Ever. And we had we had good talks. We had very good talks, but they were rough, but they were strong, and it's what you had to do. But I said, don't do it. If you do it, we are going to hit you so hard. And he said, but uh, Your Excellency, he called me Your Excellency, which is, I thought, very nice. I sort of like the sound. <laughs> he said, Your Excellency, uh, you must tell me why, why, oh, why do you send me a picture of my house? And I said, well, you're going to have to figure that one out, Abdul. But we had... But we went 18 months without one American soldier being killed in Afghanistan. Very different from our Democrat-run cities where many, many people are killed in a week in cities that are run by Democrats and badly run by Democrats. But we have a, a little thing I think we should tell you, because it's also depressing when you look at what's gone on. We rebuilt our military. Our military is great. We have great leaders. You hear all about the woke stuff. And I think a lot of our military laugh it off. But, you know, at some point, it really gets in there, and you become infected, and it's bad. But a quick story about our great U.S. military. We have a man named General Raisin Kane. Did you ever hear this story? Because I've given it a couple of times. I've told it a couple of times. But I wanted to go to Iraq, and I wanted to go to the various countries to see what was going on, because I heard all about ISIS. And I said, why aren't we getting ISIS? Why is ISIS allowed to roam free, and we're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars in the Middle East, and we don't seem to beat ISIS? General Mattis told me, sir, it'll take three years to get rid of them. And I said, General, that's not too good. How do you do that? They fight with knives, and we fight with, with the greatest weapons ever made. Ever made. We have the weaponry we have is the most incredible. I told you I rebuilt the military. Weapons we have are the greatest. Should have never given 85 billion of it to the, you know, I don't know if you know this, the Taliban. Afghanistan is just about the number one seller of arms now because they said they don't need 700,000 rifles. They don't need 70,000 trucks and cars. There's not a used car lot in the world. 
And you could multiply times 100, that would have 70,000 of anything. And we gave them 70,000 trucks. Many of them are armor-plated trucks, extremely cost millions of dollars to build these trucks individually. 70,000. We gave them night goggles, better than the ones we have, later models right out of the box. $85 billion. There's never been anything like it. So when you hear all these stories, you probably think we have a terrible military, but we don't. So what happened is I said, you know, I'm going to fly over to Iraq, and I'm going to meet with our soldiers while I was president. And we did that. We're in the plane. We're about an hour out, and they come to see me in Air Force One. Beautiful, beautiful plane. Air Force One, beautiful. I ordered new Air Force Ones. I got a much better price than the previous administration. You know that story. It's now a big topic, because now Boeing wants to get a discount, because they said they're losing the shirt on the deal we made with Trump. That's okay. Don't do it. Don't do it. But we added new Air Force Ones at a much lower price, 1.6 billion less. I got 1.6 billion off the price. You believe it? And now Boeing is complaining. But I wanted to go over and I wanted to find out about ISIS. So I get on the old Air Force One. You know, we, had, we needed new. They're 31 years old, if you can believe it. You know, Air Force One is actually two planes. It's two big 747s. So they were ordered. But we're on the plane flying over. And we're about an hour away from the big airfield that we're landing in in Iraq. And I get a call, and then some military people came in to see me. You know, this is like a, a large home Air Force One, very big. A lot of people on the plane, most talented people you've ever seen, including the pilots, the most incredible people. Sir, would you please do us a favor? We'd like to close all of your windows. I say, why? We don't want any light on the plane. I said, why is that? Because we don't want the enemy to see us. Think of it. We've been there for 20 years, and we can't fly an airplane into the country. I said, that's pretty sad. So they closed down all of the shades. Everything was absolutely dark. Then they said, sir, we're going to be turning off the lights in the plane. I said, what do you have to do that? We just closed all the shades and the windows. What do you have to do? Sir, we got to be dark. We, gotta, we don't want to get any light up there. I said, that's not good. But I love sitting with pilots, especially talented ones. And the most talented pilots in the world are the ones that fly Air Force One. And if you look at these guys, they're like central casting. They're like, they look like Tom Cruise, but better. Okay, they do. Crew cuts. So I said, well, this is interesting because, you know, we don't have any lights. I said, how the hell do I get to the pilots? I can't see. They said, follow us, sir. We go through this dark hallway and upstairs. And I sit down, and even their cockpit lights are turned off. And I said, uh, hello, Captain. Oh, sir, this, you got to see these people, I'm telling you. They could make movies. I could bring these guys out to Hollywood to be an agent. I'd make a lot of money for myself. I wouldn't make so much for them, but I'd make a lot for myself. <laughs> like many other agents. That's what agents do. They make money for themselves. But you know, I say, Captain, how are we doing? Very good, sir. I said, very dark in this plane, Captain. Yes, sir. It's okay, sir. So when are we landing, Captain? Sir, we're landing in five minutes. I said, Captain, we're pretty low. I, I don't see any runway. I don't see anything. I'm looking out the window. It's dead black. There's no light, but we're over a desert. And he said, you're going to be fine, sir. No problem. So. Three, four minutes go by, and then they hear, I don't know if anybody flies, but you hear a sound from the computer. It's an incredible voice, but it's a computer voice. It goes 1,000. Now, that means 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet is really low when you're in a big monster plane, right? 1,000 feet. Sounds high. It's not. So it goes 1,000, 900, 800, 700, 600, 500. I say, Captain. I don't see any runway, Captain. <laughs> no problem, sir. I said, all right. I'm telling my wife, you know, I told my wife how brave I was when I got. <laughs> sort of like uh, Lion Brian. Remember Lion Brian? He said he was brave, but you know, the difference is he wasn't even shot at. How's his career going? I don't think too good. But Brian Williams, remember that mess? But. So we're at 500 feet. I don't see anything. 400, 
300, 200. I say, Captain, there's no runway out there. I'm telling you, Captain. I got very good eyes. Not like they used to be, but what is, right? He said, Captain, what the hell is going on here, Captain? No problem, sir. 100. Now we're 100 feet. That's like, I'll tell you what that's like, these lights. That's a little, that's about 50. So we got a little double. That's very low. And the captain said, okay, sir, we're ready to land. I said, hey, Captain, you want to pull up, Captain? And bottom line, boom, 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 perfect landing. We landed. I say, oh, the little pin lights, tiny, you can't even see them. He hit him dead. Oh, these guys are the most talented, I'm telling you, the most talented people. I said, how did I do, Captain? Wasn't I brave? I didn't think you were going to land. I thought we were landing on ship. He said, you're a brave man. In fact, as president, I wanted to give myself the Congressional Medal of Honor, but they wouldn't let me do it. They wouldn't let me do it. I said, I'm going to give myself the con I've always wanted that. But they wouldn't let me do that. They said that would be inappropriate. I said, okay. But what happened is we landed. It was an incredible. They really are talented people, the most incredible people. And I get off the plane. And I want to find out why we can't defeat us. As I get off this plane, it's very, very late. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, pitch black. I'm getting off very few lights. And there's some soldiers down there, and there's a general, and then another general, and then a drill sergeant. And I said, look at these people. They're all like perfect people. You don't see people like this in the movie. The movies, they don't have people like this. These people are really amazing. So I'm walking down the stairs, and I meet one general, and then I meet another one. And I said, uh, what's your name? He said, Kane, sir. Kane. I said, that's nice. What's your first name? Raisin, sir. I said, wait. Did you just say your name is Raisin Kane? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm General Raisin Kane. I said, General, you're the guy I've been looking for. You're the guy I've been looking for. What a great guy. So then we go into the room. He said, sir, would you like to go to sleep for a while? And you had a long trip. You know, it's a long trip. And got a little, a little scary at the end, right? He said, uh, would you like to go and rest for a while? I think he's used to other presidents, if you want to know the truth. I said, no, let's go and have our meeting. It's OK. Let's go right away, Raisin. So the general came in and the sergeant came in. The sergeant just said, oh, man, I could take care. I could make a fortune with this guy. Perfect. Boom. I'd like to have a flat top like that. I don't think I have enough hair to pull it off. But he was great. And they were all sitting there and they had some others, all central casting people. I said, so General Mattis, world's most overrated general, said to me, it would take three years to get rid of ISIS. I want to get rid of them faster. What do you think, General? And he said, we could do it very quickly, sir. It depends on what you want to do. I said, no, I want to get rid of them. I want to get rid of them fast, General, as fast as you can. But I've been told it takes three years. And why haven't you been able to do it? Well, sir, we take orders. We don't give. When somebody comes in from Washington, when they're our superior, we are not to question when they tell us how to do it. I said, did you agree with what they were doing? Because it's been, we've been fighting them for like 19 years now, right? No, sir, we never agreed with it, sir. But it's not our position to say what they should be doing. They walk in and they tell us how to do it. I say, well, if I gave you authority to do it, how long would it take you? We could do it, sir, in three weeks. I said, General Raisin Kane, tell me about that. I've been here in three years. What do you mean three weeks? Sir, we can do it in three weeks. We'll have time left over. I said, you got to be. You got to be kidding, Raisin. Explain it. And what did they do and what would you do? Well, sir, they came over and they wanted to be politically correct, sir. And they wanted us just to hit from this base where we are right now, big base. The problem is it's very far away from the people that you're after. Very, very far away, sir. By the time we got over there, we had to come back to refuel. We couldn't spend any time. I said, so what would you do, Raisin? Sir, I'd hit him from here. But I'd hit him from there and there and here and there. 
We have bases all over the place, sir. They didn't want to use them because they didn't want to insult the country where the base was located. The country wouldn't even know, sir, what the hell we're doing or where we're going. Sir, I'd hit him from the left, and I'm hit him from the right, underneath, over the top. I'd hit him so hard they wouldn't know what was happening, sir. I said, I said, and you have to understand, Mattis told me it would take three years. He kept telling me more and more. It got to be to a point it was ridiculous. So I said, so General, I want to think about this, but I've been told it's going to take a long time, and you're telling me three weeks. You have time left over, sir. So I said, all right, look, uh, I'm going back to Washington. I got to think about this. Bottom line, I get back. I said, go get him. He hit them left and right, under and over. He hit them so hard. And I got a call two weeks later. They were just about gone, but many of them have formed an area, and they wanted permission to wipe everybody, just wipe them out. And he said, you know, look, I did really well in real estate in New York City. I'm not, like, into this stuff. But I have a lot of common sense, and I understand what has to be done. And they said, are you ready, sir? I said, ready for what? We want to wipe them out, sir. I said, wipe them out. You know, I'm thinking about humans. I said, these are human beings. And he said, no, they're not, sir. These are animals. These are animals. We want to wipe them out, sir. I said, how about taking the planes and flying over them a couple of times, General Raisin Kane? He said, you're wasting fuel if you do that, sir. I said, do you think they'd surrender? They don't know what it is to surrender, sir. They're not going to surrender. I said, try it for a day or so. Fly the F-18s over their heads, and maybe you get them to surrender. They won't do it, sir, but we're going to do it, and we'll do it. I get a call back. They're not going to do any surrendering. He said, sir, they don't surrender. It's just the way it is. They don't know the word. They don't know what the word means. I said, what are you suggesting? He said, just let us do our job, sir. I said, do your job. And that was the end. 100% of ISIS gone. 100%. General Raisin came. And the reason I thought I'd tell you that story the reason I thought I'd tell you that story, and I think it's important, especially for you, because you're young, you'll be running the country for a long time, and you saw that catastrophe in Afghanistan where we didn't know what the hell we were doing, where we took the soldiers out. Think of it. We moved the soldiers. The, the people that Abdul was so afraid of, we removed them from Afghanistan. So now we have our hostages, or we have our equipment and everything left behind. We took the soldiers out first. Remember, I told the story, I asked a five-year-old child, if you were at war and you had the kind of threat, and I explained it, would you move the soldiers, Johnny, out first or last? Oh, I'd move them out last. But our people, this is a five-year-old child, our people took our soldiers out first, and then they went after us. They did a number. They used to come out of the woods, and they'd come They'd head to certain locations, and they'd see those F-18s, which now they own. They own those F-18s that they were so afraid of, and the planes and the helicopters, best helicopters in the world, Apaches. Some of them brand new. They own them. We gave it to them, billions and billions. I think the only country that had more than them outside of us was Australia. Think of it. They had more than any other country other than Australia. The finest flying machine, the most incredible. I won't tell you what they call it, but it's not a nice name. It was, it's a vicious name. And outside of Australia, they had more than any other country. Think of this. And Australia had paid billions and billions and billions of dollars. So I wanted to tell you the story because when you see the, in my opinion, the most humiliating day in the history of our country. That was, to me, the most humiliating day in the history of our country, the most humiliating time. Now, the media hardly played it up. They, they ended that story very quickly. And maybe this is one time when it's okay to have done that because it was the greatest humiliation our country has ever seen. 
And they didn't do it for that reason. They did it because they're trying to protect Biden and they're trying to protect the Democrats and they don't want that to hurt him so badly. But I think that's when things really started going bad for this administration because nobody has ever witnessed anything like took place. Getting out of Afghanistan, we were going to do it with dignity and strength and it would have been done very quickly on a very similar time scope. But what they did was the greatest humiliation in the history of our country. So I wanted to tell you the story about Raisin Cain. I wanted to tell you the story about those other great soldiers and how they can fight. And they're unbelievable. I'm not talking about Millie and the guys on television. I'm talking about the real guys that we have out there. They're unbelievable people. They're unbelievable fighters. And it's something you have to hear.